Good morning and welcome to the Church in the Gardens on this groundbreaking Sunday morning, the fourth Sunday in Lent. We are happy to announce and praise God that this morning we have 15 people worshiping in the sanctuary with us in addition to the praise band as a trial. If you would like to worship in the sanctuary next Sunday, March 21st, you will need to call Jackie at the church office to make a reservation, or you can wait for an email with an online reservation form. We are taking all precautions to make sure everyone feels safe. We are happy once again to welcome Reverend Elizabeth Perry to our pulpit, Dr. Sonny Nabel, our music director, as well as our praise band and soloist, Jen McDonald. Um, I'm Glenda Maurer, your liturgist, and we have Mr. Rama Waruntu as our technical assistant. Please pray for all who are sick and healing, those who are grieving and hurting. Please continue to pray for the search committee who are now in a phase where they are ready to move forward with some good candidates, but have to take a break because they are busy in their own churches conducting Easter services. Um, there is a stewardship announcement from our own Cindy Herentine. Uh Is Cindy there, please? Yes, I'm here. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Good morning. My name is Cindy Herendine, and I've been invited to speak to you about why I pledge to Church in the Gardens. A quick answer is, well, because I was brought up that way. And on deeper reflection, there are many reasons why I give. I am the daughter of a father whose Quaker roots go back hundreds of years. My father's ancestors started many churches in the early days of this country. I'm the daughter of a mother who, as a child, attended whatever Protestant church was within walking distance of where they were living. My grandfather worked most Sundays and my grandmother did not drive. As a young family, my parents joined a local congregational church that burned down when I was about six. I still recall the telephone ringing in the middle of the night, my parents rushing about and being worried. My mother stayed home with me and my sisters while my father went to the church with other volunteers to rush into the building to carry out what they could while the firefighters fought the blaze. My parents still have an upright piano that was rolled out of that church that night. After the fire, the church merged with another local congregational church and became a part of the United Church of Christ. The new name of the church became Covenant. My parents remain active there and I participate as I can from 400 miles away. <clears throat> I joined Church in the Gardens about 22 years ago after a work colleague of my late husband invited us to check it out. Our oldest daughter, Julia, was about a year old, and we had decided it was time to find a church home. I remain forever grateful for Greg's casual invitation. Our entire family, Joe, Julia, Natalie, and I love the church. The 9 a.m. worship service and music, humming the songs all day, Sunday school, Christmas pageants, Advent luncheons, Easter egg hunts, retreats in Connecticut, fundraisers, dances, the list is long. We volunteered and attended many happy events. In 2011, when Joe died suddenly, our church family was there to catch us as the rug was yanked out from beneath our feet. I give of both my money and of my time. I give both because I can see what we as a congregation can do together. Together, we can be the hands and the feet of Christ in our world. We support those less fortunate at the Briarwood Family Shelter with Angel Tree Gifts and other giving events. We feed the hungry through our food collection. We provide for those in need of comfort by offering space and shelter for 12-step and other support groups. We provide for spiritual connection through worship services and prayer events, either in person or on Zoom, silent prayer meditation, the Wednesday prayer group, Sunday school, Bible study, prayer retreats. 
We provide for education, personal growth, and friendship by using our buildings for the pre-K and nursery school programs, the Music Mommy and Me program, the Boy Scouts. We provide opportunities for the larger Forest Hills community to come together, whether it be for blood donation drives, the Beer in the Gardens event, <clears throat> the Interfaith Thanksgiving service, the Harvest Bazaar, the Volunteer Fair. We provide for joy and beauty our sanctuary hosting many wonderful music and performance events. And we advance Christ's message of inclusion, compassion, light, love, and social justice when we give to the missions of the UCC. So yes, I give because I was brought up that way. I give because of the love and warmth and support we offer one another. <clears throat> I give because I believe that we as the church in the gardens are the hands and feet of Christ in this world together. And by moving as the body of Christ, we continue to share his unending message of light and love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Our, for the season of Lent, silent prayer is still uh, occurring on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. via Zoom. If you're interested in participating, let Cindy Herendine know to be provided with the Zoom link and details. Denise Ost, our BOCI chair, is holding Sunday school uh, virtually for now, and they are having discussions about putting together the Easter egg hunt. That is close to final, but not final yet. The care committee of the deacons are still available for anyone in need. They are, you can call one of these folks, Laura Jett, Cassandra Hawkins, Yang Huang, Emily Mafuti, and Betty Sheets. There are more announcements in the weekly word. And if you are not receiving this electronic publication, you would, and you would like to, please call or email the church office. And now, Reverend Perry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, our opening prayer today is from a book called A New New Testament for the 21st Century. Uh, the prayer is titled Prayer of Thanksgiving, and it was one of uh, 52 ancient documents that were discovered by archaeologists in 1945 in Nag Hammadi, Egypt. The prayer itself is undated, but it's believed to be from very early in the life of the church, likely uh, prayed by Christians in the first century or maybe early second century before the church became really organized and formalized. I've shortened it a good bit by uh, leaving out some verses, but I've not changed the wording of the translation at all. So this is how those early Christians gave thanks to God in their worship. Let us pray. We give thanks to you. Every life and heart stretches towards you, O oh, name untroubled, honored with the name of God, praised with the name of Father. To everyone and everything comes the kindness of the Father and love and desire. We have known you, O oh, light of mind, O oh, light of life, we have known you. O oh, womb of all that grows, we have known you. O oh, never-ending endurance of the Father who gives birth, so we worship your goodness. One wish we ask, we wish to be protected in knowledge. One protection we desire, that we not stumble in this life. Amen. Cindy, I believe, or Glenda, I believe you need to unmute. I keep getting muted. I don't know why. Um, our call to worship this morning is Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3, and verses 17 through 22. I will be the leader, and Reverend Perry will be the people. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those who redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the east, west, north, and south. 
Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, who saved them from their distress, sent out a word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for steadfast love, God's wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's a very exciting day. We're, we're uh, not only broadcasting from the church, but um, here, if I can change the view, you should be able to see a few of your friends here in the congregation. So hallelujah, we're back, little by little. So thank, thank you all for uh, being part of this, this Sunday. Um, let us all join together singing throughout these Lenten days and nights. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive us and set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen.
hear these words of assurance. Almighty God does freely pardon and forgive all our sins through the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. And now might we share the signs of peace with each other in whatever way you are most uh, comfortable doing it. Uh, I prefer touching my camera to reach out and touch to all of you. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Our first reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The second reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work amongst, among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works that no one may boast, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Hello, everyone. Uh, last week, I talked about the Hellenistic Jewish worldview that Paul was writing about in the letter to the Corinthians. It was a dualistic worldview where spirit and body were divided and where people wanted to understand Christian faith from the point of view of that division. Uh, they believed that because they were dead and resurrected with Christ, because Christ had already defeated sin and death, because of all of that, they wouldn't have to physically die. They were already living in the resurrection. Christ would return and they would have avoided death altogether. However, that way of thinking, that, uh, that kind of theology was causing the Corinthians some problems. And it was causing other Hellenistic Jews as well problems. Uh, people like the Ephesians that Paul was writing to in today's epistle reading. That dualism of the Hellenistic world made those fledgling Christians pretty sure that they were spiritually better than everyone else, and that spiritual superiority was a problem of it, its own. It was the, the kind of self-elevation that moved them further and further away from the physical world and, and alienated them from other people. But it also caused additional problems like waiting. Chris Becker, my professor from seminary days that I talked about last week, um, he wrote in that book that I was talking about last week as well, Paul the Apostle, that by Paul's time, which was two to three decades after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the believers in Ephesus were just sitting around waiting for Jesus' return. Uh, remember, Jesus had said he was returning soon, but 25 years was not 
soon in terms of people who had a life expectancy of only about 40 years. Some of the first believers had already died by the time Paul was writing his letters. But these Hellenistic Jews were still just waiting around uh, for the shedding of their mortal bodies, Becker says, um, and the opening of the door to immortality, the opening of the door to paradise. In this letter, Paul is telling the Ephesians to stop that waiting, to get moving, to take some action, to do more than just sit around and wait. They were to get to work. But Paul had to ground their work in the, in the proper place. He had to be aware of creating an additional problem that they didn't need to have. Because the Ephesians could have gone the other extreme. Instead of fixated on waiting, they could have been, become fixated on works. And that could have led them to works righteousness, the belief that our works earn us salvation. I mean, you know that what that's like, right? You know, uh, thinking that we can buy salvation with our good works. We've all experienced that at, uh, ourselves sometimes or, or seen it in others. We hear it when we hear people say things like, if you had enough faith, you'd be healed. Or God helps those who help themselves. Or you know, these people don't say quite as often out loud, but it's subtle in their actions and other things. They say, I'm a better Christian because... I serve on more committees, or I have more knowledge, or I help more people, or I give more money. It was a thin path that Paul had to walk in order to address the problems in Ephesus. Paul knew why they should get to work, but he had to lay out his argument in a way that they would actually hear and listen to, and that would keep them centered in the faith. Now, reading all of this, um, it reminded me of a year or so back in the late 1970s. Um, I had a job selling life insurance door to door in a poor community in central Pennsylvania. Almost everyone thought that life insurance was absolutely vital to have, but to be willing to uh, or able to commit to putting that, some money into it, well, that was a completely different thing. As salespeople, we were trained in how to overcome that resistance. And I remember a little bit of the training. I remember a stand-up book that we had to flip through one page at a time with our customers. And the process in that book and the process I was taught was really pretty simple. People don't want to talk about death. So one, listen to what they're saying. And then two, understand what they're saying so that three, you can respond appropriately, and then four, confirm that the customer's in agreement with you by getting them to five, sign on the bottom line, and do all of that with a sense of urgency so they sign right away. Yes, you are short of money right now. That's a very real thing. But imagine how much tighter the budget would be if the cost of a funeral was thrown in or if you lost one income. Don't you think you should sign this application right now? I have to confess that I was not very good at sales. <laughs> I never have been. Um, I commiserated too much with my, my customers and I wasn't very good at the sales pitch. I was uh, not very convincing at it. But Paul was a master at it. In this letter, he was selling the Ephesians a worldview, a view of salvation that he knew they didn't want to buy, a worldview that included the acceptance of death that they didn't even want to talk about, let alone listen to. So he had done what we were taught to do as salespeople. He had listened to their views and opinions and beliefs. He understood what they were saying, and he was responding to their views, taking their argument that they had already been saved and that Christ's death and resurrection was their death and resurrection and then building his own argument on that. So he tells them that, yes, they had been living a physical life full of sin, just like all of humanity. And yes, God loved humanity even then. God loved humanity enough to provide salvation, a gift unearned, unworked for, a free gift of new life with and in Christ. And then once the Ephesians knew that Paul had heard and understood them, that they were talking about the same thing, they were on the same page, then Paul moved them forward with his argument. God gave that good gift of salvation. 
because that is what humanity was created to be. That was the purpose of human life, to be saved. But that wasn't the end of the process for Paul, because they weren't just saved. They were saved for something. They were saved so they could do what God created them to do, good works that God designed just for them. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. God, through Jesus Christ, created humanity so that humanity could live a life of good works, not in order to earn God's love because humanity had already been given that, not even in order to earn a good life in this life, but the natural outcome of the fullness of life that humanity had already been given. Now, I think that because we read this in English, we can miss some of the meaning in the original words that indicate the depth of work that Paul's referring to, both humanity's work and God's work. I looked at a number of different English versions. The New International Version says, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. The Berean Study Bible says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The International Standard Version says, we are God's masterpiece created in the Messiah Jesus to perform good actions. We are of God's making. That's the new century version. We are God's accomplishment, the common English Bible. We are the product of God's hand, heavenly poetry etched on lives. That's the translation called the voice. Holman Christian Standard Bible says we are God's creation. And the message says that we are created to join Jesus in the work that he does. God worked through Jesus to create us. God worked to create the good works for us to do. And now we work. We put our work into doing the work God created. We often say, you and I, are we're made in the image of God. And in doing good works, we live out that image. Christians often say we live in imitation of Christ. And in doing good works, we live out that imitation. But I also wondered, what are these good works? Works that, that don't earn us God's love, but works that enable us to show God's love to each other. Works that show God's face to the world, show our faith in Jesus to the world. I, I found a website online. It's called The Theology of Work, and I, I don't really know much about it, but I was intrigued by something they said. They said that it was natural to think of good works as typical church activities, uh, worship, prayer, study, that sort of thing, or, or maybe as mission and outreach work. But that website said that Paul is much more focused on a full life, which includes our work life. And the website urges viewers to, and I'm quoting, see your whole life as an interconnected series of good works offered to God. Sounds like what Paul says very clearly in Romans 12, 1, when he wrote, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Not just your spirits and beliefs, but your physical bodies and your actions. In the message, which is my favorite translation of Romans 12, 1, it's one of my favorite voices, uh, verses, it translates this way. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Weeks ago, when I started writing this sermon, I couldn't help but think about all of this, not just in terms of that old sales job that I didn't excel at very much, but in current terms of COVID-19. Uh, we are one year this Sunday from the first time we gathered in Zoom together a year ago. It's a very Ephesians-like time right now, isn't it? The pandemic world's a dualistic one, the bad bodies separated from the physical or the good spirit and the physical gatherings replaced by a spiritual gathering. But much worse, this body-spirit separation has put many people into a waiting pattern. I'm glad to see by this test Sunday that you've been using the time to do some good work in your sanctuary in this pre-paradise, still pandemic time. 
uh, but my primary work's leading online courses for church leaders, working with sometimes 100 to 200 congregations a month. And you cannot imagine how many church people I hear say, we're talking about the ministries we'll do when we get back in our buildings after the pandemic. They're waiting till the crisis is over to do any ministry. Like the Ephesians, they're sitting around waiting for the body problems to disappear so they can be transported to paradise. I heard a friend talk the other day, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess it is. But he was talking about his uh, kind of large uh, multi-state, multi-denominational ministry. And one of the things that he said really, really struck me like a brick. He said he was hearing from the denominations where the denomination owns the church buildings, that those denominations are actually talking about selling all of their buildings and moving to a house church model. Imagine how silly people might feel if they had been waiting a year 18 months, maybe two years, to do ministry in a church building and then find out that the building's been sold before they ever get to do those ministries they'd been waiting to do. A year and more of opportunities lost. I, I'm not Paul by any means, but I think I feel some of the heartbreak that Paul must have felt for those Ephesians. Why were they wasting this opportunity? We humans were created to do good works, not later on when people are safe from disaster, but right now in the disaster when they need us. God has already saved us from real disaster. God has already loved us, given us fullness of life in this life, as well as the life to come. And fullness of life here means fullness of living as we've been created to live, living in response to God's great gift of life and love. Now, I've I've also heard from congregations who are, are responding in that way, who are doing good work, stepping up their ministry right now in the pandemic. A one congregation I heard about this week had a backpack ministry for school children, and they translated that into a food delivery ministry that's many times larger than the previous ministry was. Another congregation had reached their outreach to the homebound. Another stepped up their children's ministries with a six-week winter VBS online. And another runs the thrift shop. I was amazed at this story. It was started in 1950 when there were three thrift shops in their county. And now it's the only one left serving 8,000 people. It's the only place in their county where people who have lost jobs and savings and homes during the pandemic can buy shoes or clothes or food at extremely low prices. And that congregation puts all the proceeds from that thrift shop back into other community programs. And the congregation ties all of their congregational income from any source into that thrift shop. When the pandemic ends, if the pandemic ends, when we find ourselves in paradise, if we find ourselves there, when we, when we get to to return to a non-dualistic world where body and spirit do coincide. Those who have needs today that we aren't meeting with our good works, those we don't reach out to touch, or those we, we just sit back and wait for better days to reach out to, they're going to remember our absence. And those we have touched right now today in these long but fragile days of recovery and waiting, they will remember our good works and more. They might see the face of the God who loves us, who loves them too, in the fullness of the life we embody, even in the face of death. Let us pray like those early Christians prayed. One protection we desire that we not stumble in this life, that we might not stumble in these troubled times from doing the good we could be doing. For we are what God has made us to be. We are created in Christ Jesus for the good works we can do which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Amen. And let us respond by singing God of grace, God of glory.
As we prepare for um, prayers of the people, I would say um, that I'm going to ask you for your prayer requests. For those of you who are in Zoom, you can unmute yourself and ask for the prayer requests and then mute yourself again. For those who are in the sanctuary, you can say it aloud where you are at and um, Sonny will repeat it into his microphone so that we in Zoom can hear you as well. So I'll start by saying I'm asking for your prayers. I got my second shot on Friday, hallelujah. Uh, but boy, am I not feeling so good. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm still upright. Praise God for that too. But I do ask for your prayers over the next day or so. Are there others who have prayer requests, joys and concerns, or perhaps ministries that you have been doing that you'd like to celebrate? suffered a stroke yesterday. I'd like to say a prayer of thanks for um, the continued efforts of the praise band and the technical team and those people who, who could join us today in person and those um, continuing online. It's, I think it's a real community effort and um, it's amazing we're, we're still going so strong. And so I, I just want to lift up a prayer of thanks. Are there others? Alan, thank you, dear God, for the world service and Jim Marsh for gathering over 50 pints of blood last Sunday. It was a very successful blood drive, and we thank you. Praise God. We have a prayer here from uh, Amelia Everett. The, the widespread uh, availability of the vaccine, uh, a prayer of thanksgiving. Yeah. Sonny, could you repeat the name of the person who suffered a stroke? Claudia. Claudia? Claudia Tejeda. Thank you. That's from Mike Jett, our drummer here. Let us turn to God in prayer. Oh, gracious God, for so many things, we come before you as Christians be throughout the centuries have come before you. We come to you and we thank you for the kindness that you reach out to us with. We thank you for the love you have given to us. We thank you for the work you have created for us to do. In each of our lives, we have those moments where we need your presence, those moments where we or those we love suffer and we know that we can come to you for strength and comfort, for the Holy Spirit's power and healing. But we also have those times of joy and thanksgiving in our lives, and we know that you share those too. You smile along with us. You laugh along with us. You, you sing along with us. For both those walks with us, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for those groups and organizations, churches and others who are doing ministry, the blood drive and, and food ministries and all those other things that are caring for hurting people in a hurting world. We thank you that there are untold opportunities for us, no matter what part of life we are ourselves in, there are opportunities for us to reach out and take care of somebody else. A loving phone call, 
a kind note, donating blood, feeding people with food deliveries, money donations, helping others by listening to them and leading them closer to the love of God that we show through our actions. We pray for our country. We pray for our state. We pray for our community. We pray for our world, the whole of creation. We pray that you would continue to pour out that kindness of yours, that love and salvation to everyone and everything, every bit of life throughout this universe. And we pray that you would continue to lay before us those good works and guide us to do them and continue to do a good work within us. In Jesus' name we pray, as he taught his disciples how to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now it is time to offer our tithes and offerings to God. There are three ways that you can make a contribution by sending a check to the Church in the Gardens at 50 Ascan Avenue, Forest Hills, New York, 11375. You can set up a bill payment through your bank to have your checks mailed to the church, or you can do it through PayPal by going to our website, the citg.org, and click on the upper right corner on the donate link.
Let us pray. Dear God, we praise your goodness in allowing us to come together today, not only virtually, but for some together in the church. Help us to be fixated, not on waiting, but on working to prepare ourselves for the next chapter of our journey through this life. We thank you for your gift of your son who taught us how to live. Please accept our offerings and use them to further your mission for us here at church, in our city, and in our world. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. And let us all join together singing, I want Jesus to walk with me.
this week, might your life and your heart reach out toward God. Might you receive God's kindness and might you do the work that God has prepared for you to do. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer. Amen. Okay, well, while we're still unmuted here, I'll, I'll, um, we're, for those folks who are at home, you can't see, but you are up on a, our gigantic screen, which is to my right, and uh, everyone in congregation can see you. So if you'd like to speak to the, anyone here, that's possible. Thank you, Reverend. You're quite welcome. I am going to uh, take myself back to a reclining position, I do believe, and uh, I will see you all next week. <laughs> okay, prayers for your, your uh, continued. Thank you. I'm, I'm taking it as a win that my immune system still works. <laughs> Good. Great. Uh, take care. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you to Sunny and to Rama for a year of true 
dedicated discipleship and just hard work. We thank you. So remember, reach out to uh, Jackie if you want to make a reservation to come to one of the upcoming services. Here they go. Uh -oh. They're headed outside for the coffee.